Hello, here are your Phyla mollusca video notes. So interesting fact, mollusks are actually only second to arthropods in the number of living species. So there are a ton of different species in this phylum. So in general, Phyla mollusca, mollusca means soft bodied. So all of these organisms have soft bodies. Some of them do have shells, which you'll see in a minute, but we also have ones like the squid or the octopus or sea cucumber that do not. So 50, 555 million years ago, this shows the ancestral tree. So we've looked at sponges, whoops. We've looked at sponges and flatworms and roundworms, and we've looked at nadarians. So we've kind of covered all the bottom here. So now we're going this way into the mollusks. And as you can see, annelids actually branched above the mollusks, which we've already talked about. So some molluscan characteristics. So they range in size and body shape. The largest ones can be up to 1,000 pounds, 18 meters long, such as the giant squid, but 80% of them are actually less than five centimeters in length. Here's some other general characteristics. So they have three regions of their body, somewhere, someplace called a head foot, they have a visceral mass, and they have a mantle. The mantle cavity is that main function for excretion, gas exchange, reproduction. That's a really important structure. They have bilateral symmetry and protostome development, but they are true coelomates. And they do all have an open circulatory system except cephalopods. Those do not. And those, that blood is located in a tissue place called a sinus. They also have something called a radula, which is used for scraping food. The mollusk body, the three regions, so the head foot like we talked about, this is kind of the head and the foot combined as the name would suggest. So it helps with nervous structures and locomotion. That visceral mass, which you can see by looking at this diagram, is this space inside that contains all the organs. And then the mantle is usually the shell. Some other body parts. So the mantle, like we talked about, attaches to that visceral mass and encompasses most of the body. The mantle cavity is between the mantle and the foot. It's open to the outside. It has, it's really important for gas exchange, excretion, and reproduction. And that radula that we talked about. So it's known as something called a tooth tongue. And it's a rasping structure that's found in the mouth. And it helps them with getting their food. So let's take a look at some of the classes. So gastropoda means stomach foot. And this is the largest and most varied class of mollusks. There's over 35,000 living species. Examples, snails, slugs, conch, limpets. They can live in marine, freshwater, or terrestrial habitats. Most of them do have shells, which is made of calcium carbonate. They also can do something called torsion. So this is 180 degrees twisting of the visceral mass, the mantle, and the mantle cavity. And this is how they actually bring their head into their shells. They also have something called an operculum, which is what closes the shell opening. If you've ever gone looking for seashells, you may have noticed that when you pick them up, you can tell the ones that are alive because there's like this covering at the opening. That's the operculum. And there's different types of shell coiling. So they can be whorl or apex. And we'll look at some of that in class. And there's a flattened foot for locomotion. So they have the shell, they can hide in their shell, but when they move, they come out. So they use cilia and muscular contractions to do this. And then they use that radula that we talked about for scraping food. Some maintenance functions. So their gas exchange is going to occur in the mantle cavity, and they have that open circulatory system we talked about. They also have a three-chambered heart and a hydraulic skeleton, so they don't have bones, but they do have fluid that's in a pressure in the body that helps keep their shape. And some of them are dioecious and some are monoecious, so it just depends on the species in terms of their reproduction organs. So here's a sketch of the gastropoda. This is just a typical snail that you would see. Um, I would like you to take a minute here. You can pause this, you can screenshot it, you can sketch it, but you definitely need to have this drawing with these labels in your notes. So next up, class bivalvia. So these are your typical seashells that you find. So they have two sides or two valves. They're the second largest molluscan class with almost 30,000 species. So clams, oysters, mussels, scallops, a lot of things you actually eat. Like, and some of them even form pearls. So they're good for food, but they're also a good source for jewelry as well. Some characteristics, they can be marine or freshwater. 
They don't have a head or radula, and most of them are filter feeders, so they have gills and siphons to help with that. They also have something called adductor muscles, which are used for defense, aka they close the shell really tight for protection. And you can see those muscles are shown in that picture up there. It shows how they open them. When You can see them when they open, but when they close, it keeps the shell really tight so you can't pry it open. And that mantle is going to attach around those muscles. So the shell wants those adductor muscles to be very close by for protection. And also the pearl that we mentioned, this forms when sand lands between the mantle and the adductor muscles. So as you can see this picture here, there's several pearls inside of this shell. Some other characteristics. So the foot is going to project from the front end of the animal through the valves. And it's used for burrowing. They also have a siphon, which is kind of like a neck, and it's used for that intake of food and water and the release of waste. They do have a complete digestive tract, but they have a reduced nervous system. So a little bit more about the shell and shell structure. So there's two halves of the shell, and these are called valves, and there's a part of the shell called the umbo, and this is the oldest part of the shell near the anterior end. Here's another image of the picture. So you can see the growth rings in this picture here, and the umbo is that end. And then also ligaments are what holds them together. Once again, if you've ever gone hunting for shells on the beach, you see that kind of fleshy material that's holding the two ends together. That, those are ligaments. So some shell coloration is also important to note. So something called notato markings. There's controversy on whether this is actually a different species or just a natural form of the shells. There's also chestnut colored chevron shaped markings and these are actually one to two percent of wild clams and they're bred into cultured clams actually as a marketing tool to sell seashells. A little bit more about the gills and feeding. So the cilia on that incurrent siphon, incurrent meaning it goes in, and gill filaments are going to move water through the animal. There's mucus on the gill trap, which traps the entering particles, and those are going to move towards the pelps by a food groove. The pelps then sort the food before it enters the mouth, and the rejected matter is just dropped and released. So here's a look at the feeding and living. So it just shows the shell here. We start at A, we progress this way. They can burrow down and then they can come out there. Another type of shell can burrow down, come out. So lots of different shells, they're very capable of burrowing under the sand and hiding, whether that be from predators or the tide levels. Here's another image of the burrowing behavior of shells. And reproduction. So most of them are dioecious, but some are monoecious. And those gonads are going to be in a visceral mass. They also do mostly have external fertilization, but they have something called that trochophore larva. So if you remember, we talked about this in a previous unit. It's kind of that cylindrical thing, and it spins, and that's how the offspring move when they're at the larval stage before they develop into the adult. So here's another picture that I'd like you to sketch, or you can pause and screenshot. It just gives you the general the general external anatomy and things that you need to know. So it shows the growth rings, the valves. It also shows the dorsal, ventral, anterior, posterior ends, which is really important when we get to the clam dissection. And here's a look at the internal sketch. So once again, I'd like you to pause it here and either sketch this or you can screenshot it and print it out. But the internal anatomy is also very important and you will be asked to identify some of these, some of these features on a test. Next up is class cephalopoda. So these are the ones that mean head foot. They usually don't have shells. So this is going to include things like the octopus, a squid, a cuttlefish, a nautilus. They are the most complex mollusks and or invertebrates. And it's, what's interesting is that their foot is modified into a circle of tentacles and a siphon. Like I mentioned, they have a reduced or absent shell and their head is in line with their visceral mass. So their body features are quite a bit different than what we've previously talked about. So with their shell being reduced or absent, the Nautilus is the only one that has a shell. So let's look at the different other species. So the cuttlefish, they actually have an internal shell. The cuttle bone is used to make polishing powder. It's actually a bird treat. So next time you go to a pet store, go down the bird aisle and you'll sh you should see cuttle bones that are for sale for birds. And now you'll know that they come from inside of a cuttlefish. 
The squid have something called a pen. So it's an internal ch uh, chitinous structure and it helps keep the structure internally, but it allows the squid to still be very mobile. And there's also cartilaginous plates in the mantle wall, the head and the neck. And the octopus is just completely absent. It doesn't have anything resembling a shell whatsoever. Their locomotion is also quite a bit different from the, sh the other clams and things that we've talked about. So they use a jet propulsion system, and this is muscle contractions, and what it does is it forces water through their siphon funnel, and it helps them move very quickly. Cuttlefish and squid especially are very, very motile. They're able to move very quickly. They can get out of harm's way or escape predators. Octopus tend to be a little more sedentary. They're the ones that you kind of see around the reefs, and they're on the the bottom, whereas cuttlefish and squid are usually up in the water swimming. In terms of their maintenance, so they have adhesive cups or like little suction cups for capture. Those are on their tentacles. They also have beak-like jaws and a radula, and they have a complete digestive tract, a closed circulatory system, and a complex nerve system. So like I said, these are the most complex invertebrates that we will come across. And they also have a brain and an eye. So this is the first time we're actually seeing a brain versus the ganglia that we've seen in some of the worms and other animals. They do also have chromatophores, which are used for defense, and these are really great for color change. They can also discharge ink, so when we dissect squid, you will see that firsthand. Their reproduction, they are dioecious. They have one tentacle of the male is modified for the spermatophore, and this transfers into the female's mantle cavity. They also entwine their tentacles during copulation or mating, as you can see, these pictures both show that mating, and we'll watch a video in class that shows this. The spermatophores are then going to burst open in the mantle cavity, and they release eggs through the oviduct. And these fertilized eggs will then just attach to the substrate until they hatch into a new octopus. So here's a squid diagram for you. Once again, you need to pause this and either sketch it or screenshot it. So this is the external anatomy of the squid. And this is the internal anatomy. So pause here, sketch it, or screenshot this as well. This will come in very handy when we do our squid dissection and when you have your test on squid anatomy. Finally, we're gonna talk about just some of the smaller classes of mollusks. So class polyplacophora means many plates. So the prefix poly is many, and then placophora is plates. These are things called chitons, and they live in shallow marine waters. You may have seen these before if you've ever done some snorkeling or maybe even some scuba diving. They have a reduced head and a flattened foot, and they actually have eight dorsal valves or like eight sections of their shell. And they do crawl very similar to gastropods when they move. Scaphopoda means boat foot. So boat foot, these are tooth shells or tusk shells. As you can see here, it's hard to imagine how something like that would even have this really complex system that you see below, but they do. They are burrowing marine animals and it's a conical shell. It does open at both ends, which helps with their body processes and the head and foot are going to project from the wider end of the shell. Class monoplacophora, mono meaning one, means one plate. So this is an undivided arched shell, has a broad flat foot, as you can see in this picture here. It has repeated pairs of gills and foot retractor muscles. And interestingly enough, they were actually thought to be extinct until 1952. And finally, class A placophora, A meaning without, and then placophora plate, these lack a shell and they crawl on a ventral surface. So their body and nervous system is actually very similar to flatworms, which we've talked about. And most of them are surface dwellers on coral. And that is all.